Well, welcome uh, to all of those attending. This is Genealogy A to Z, a trivia adventure with Thomas McKenty. Um, we are excited for this presentation and as all of our friends are coming online, um, we wanna just welcome all of you to Roots Tech 2024, remember. Thomas McKenty is the genealogy guy. Uh, and he's the guy with a love of punk rock music, but also art history and somehow fell into the technology industry years ago. He left that lucrative tech career to pursue a love of family history and genealogy. And so technology and historical research, while they may feel like opposites, tech people like Thomas are needed to guide us through the maze of options so that people can find their ancestors and bring their stories to life. So, Thomas McKenty, we turn the time over to you. Great. Thank you, you Colin. Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, get going here. So I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I am not going to stay on camera because I don't want to interfere with the ability to view the slides. I know that's important, uh, but uh, I am in Chicago, what I call the third coast, uh, and it's 27 Fahrenheit here, but you know, it's going to be 73 on Sunday, so go figure. So we're here for genealogy A to Z, a trivia adventure, and I am going to go ahead and turn off my camera there we go. And let's get started. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is copyrighted material, although you will be able to access this recording and the handout uh, at the Roots Tech site after this is over. And I think that is a really really good resource. The other thing I do want to point out, though, uh, one thing that I do, and this is part of my abundance model, is I do allow genealogy societies, public libraries, and historical societies to use my handouts as an article for their newsletter. I know what it's like to produce those newsletters. So what I really prefer is my email is at the top of the handout, or I will show it again at the end. Just have your editor email me. I also have 40, probably 50 other articles uh, that they can get. This is all for free. All I want is a little recognition, uh, but I do need to point that out. But you should go through me or have your editor go through me. Uh, so this, this is a fun game that I've done in person, a little bit different online. Uh, and we're going to go through the alphabet. There's a lot of terminology to know and genealogy. I hope we have some beginners here. And I'm going to take a sip of some iced tea here so I don't lose my voice. But uh, there's a lot of terminology. These This is curated by me. These are what I think are important or that are unusual and you may not know about. So I'm hoping. Uh, now, you don't need to write down the URLs. They are in the handout. That is a big resource for you. And I don't believe in bullet point handouts. My handouts are usually four plus pages. Uh, I b believe if you're going to you're going to honor me with your presence during a webinar for up to an hour, then you deserve more than a bullet point outline where you have to take notes. So you can pull this handout out at any time over the next few weeks and months and uh, start using these resources. So A is for archives. Uh, and one thing that you may not know is Here's the question. What's the best online resource to locate archives using primary source materials for the U.S., Canada, and Australia? This one is really not well known. It's called Archive Grid. It's run by the OCLC organization, which also runs WorldCat, better known as Interlibrary Loan. But let's take a quick look at their website here. Uh, and it is, you know, basically you can put in your address and you can actually look for archives in your area or a specific area. Uh, and so here I am. I'm in uh, Chicago, uh, Illinois, uh, where many are cold, but few are frozen. Uh, and let's see what we've got. Uh, I've got uh, Ball State. I've got, uh, yeah, here's other resources. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks Building at Illinois State Library. Uh, you can also do uh, German uh, genealogy, or I'll just do German, and you can search by keyword as well. Uh, and so there, some of these also have online archives. So don't dismiss it as something that you have to go. Here it is, 91,000 uh, record, uh, basically archives, probably some duplicates that deal with German. So it's called Archive Grid. It's been around. It includes 7 million records describing 
archival materials, so more like finding aids. Uh, and so that's really kind of neat. Let's go to our next one. B is for birth records. This is a tricky one. What is a delayed birth certificate? And can it be used to secure a passport? Well, the thing is, a delayed one is this, and I'm going to go, U.S. State Department has a great uh, description here uh, for citizenship evidence. And let's wait for this, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. Okay, great. Uh, basically, uh, this is what a delayed uh, birth certificate is. It is a certificate much later for someone. Uh, it's usually to reconstruct a birth certificate. I'll give you an example. My mother-in-law was born in Greece in 1933. When she escaped the Civil War in the late 40s, there was she had no birth record, which was common back then. So her mother had to sit down with the Greek Orthodox priest, and they sort of determined, oh, well, Maria was born after the Epiphany, which is January 6th. And, and so they picked a date, January 10th, but they created a delayed birth certificate. It usually requires an affidavit or a witness. Uh, and so some places, people that are born uh, a long time ago or in a rural area, it's common to have this type of birth certificate. C is for census. When was the 1950 U.S. Census released, and is there a searchable name index? Well, I want to thank Family Search for being a part of the effort in the release. The release was on April 1st, 2022, almost two years ago. If you know how the U.S. federal census works, there's a 72-year privacy hold on census records being released to the public. So the census day in 1950 was April 1st, 1950, at 72, and you've got 2022. One of the big innovations, and here's the announcement that Family Search did. Uh, one of the biggest innovations is Family Search paired up with National Archives as well as Ancestry, and they used artificial intelligence to read the handwriting of enumerators. That's amazing, because I know for the census for my ancestors, the enumerators, they have their own font, I swear. So the thing is, they were able to read the handwriting and produce a basic index from day one. Yes, it had to be cleaned up, but we didn't have to index it manually the way many records have been indexed at FamilySearch and other sites. So you can go ahead and access that now. Uh, and I will tell you that is the last uh, census that actually required an enumerator to show up in person. By 1960, it was going by mail. Uh, and so that's a little bit of trivia there. D is for disasters. So what is this about? Well, what is the most common disaster in the United States impacting access to records? For genealogy research. What do you think it is? Is it flood? Is it tornado? Is it fire? Well, in a way, it is fire. Uh, and I'm going to highlight this one, uh, burned counties research. What do you mean? The, count, the whole county burned? It's also known as burned courthouse research. Uh, and this is a great article in the wiki, the family search wiki. I'm going to close a few other uh, things here. Perfect. And uh, so I don't blow up the internets here. They've got a great article on Burned County's research. Uh, and here's a more recent photo of a courthouse going up in flames. Uh, it's very common. It's more common in the South during the U.S. Civil War, 1861 to 1865. And basically, these records had not been digitized. There were no other copies. So what you have to do is you need to look at substitute records to do that. Also, there were, I know of three major fires that affected uh, U.S. Census records. In 1911, the New York State Library had a major fire in Albany, New York, and lost almost all the colonial period records. Okay, so that's specific to New York. But then we also had, in 1923, the fire at the U.S. Census Bureau. And basically, that's why the 1890 federal census is not available. It was a combination of fire and flood. And then more recently in 1973, the National Personnel Records Center for the U.S. military in St. Louis uh, basically lost all the Army and Air Force records due to a fire. Uh, and so that's that's why you'll see more naval records and things like that. So it is it is important to actually go and seek out substitute records. Uh, and this is a great, uh, great article on what you can look for. So uh, uh, 
Yeah, so it is fire, uh, and that would make sense. E is for evidence. What is evidence evaluation or evidence analysis, and why is it an important part of the GPS, genealogical proof standard? Well, this is what it is. Evidence analysis is really important. I'll tell you, here's true confessions. I've been doing genealogy 47 years. I started as a 14-year-old boy uh, living with my great-grandparents. And back then, I didn't do evidence analysis. It means looking at a document and determining its strengths and weaknesses in terms of proving something like a birth date. Okay, so did you know that Evidence Explained, the book, has its own website? Uh, thank, thank goodness for Elizabeth Schoen Mills. This is Evidence Explained. I urge you to sign up so you can participate in the message forums. Also, I urge you print out this little evidence analysis map, put it up on your office wall or your genealogy cave. And basically, this these are the three areas. When you have a document, you have to determine, is it original or a derivative? An original is really rare, but it would be like the original birth certificate. A derivative would be like a birth index, okay? Uh, it could also be a microfilm, but more likely, excuse me, hiccups, uh, more likely a derivative is, and this is why it's not as good as original. When you have a derivative record, it means someone took and looked at the original and created it out of the original and transcribed information, and we know that can be filled with errors. Information. Information is either primary or secondary. An example, my great-grandfather's World War I draft card, June 5th, 1916, it's filled out in his own hand and signed by him. That's primary. But his death certificate in 1977 uh, is secondary. Uh, it's very rare that someone that dies fills out their own death certificate. So his wife was the informant. So anytime you have an informant, you basically could get errors in information. It's based on what they remember. Uh, emotions could really play into it. Uh, so that it, primary is always better than secondary. And then the other one is direct or indirect. Let me explain this. Say that you're looking for a birth date. Direct, it would just say, uh, you know, uh, he was born January 31st, 1896. That is direct as you can get. But what if you looked at the 1900 census uh, or the 1920 census for the same person, and it just lists his age? So it lists his age as 23 in 1920, and you got to do math, and you say, oh, he was born around 1897. That's indirect. So think of it. Indirect is when you back engineer to get to what the answer is. And of course, direct is always better than indirect. So there's your evidence analysis exam. Uh, uh, exam for the day. F is for females. What is one of the best resources, book, website, record set for locating family ancestors in the U.S.? This is the one that I own, and I highly recommend it. The Hidden Half of the Family by Christina Schaefer. It is available on Amazon. Uh, it's probably available at the Family History Library. Uh, it is, even though don't be uh, dismayed by the publication date, it is amazing. It's soft cover. Uh, it goes on sale occasionally, uh, but it is the source book for women's genealogy. It really is. I'm going to go ahead and close those. Perfect. Back to our slideshow. G is for GPS. So what do I mean by that, GPS? Okay. Well, it's, it's not like driving, but in a way it is like driving. Uh, GPS stands for, what does it stand for? And what organization maintains the standards? Well, GPS stands for Genealogical Proof Standard. This has come about uh, so that there is a methodology and some standards uh, to actually proving. Now, I'm a big believer that uh, family history without proof is mythology. Okay, I want to have proof. Uh, I'm building a legacy when I do my research for my family. I have 41 first cousins, and they all have kids. So I want to make sure that I do my best to get the right results. So BCG, Board for Certification of Genealogists, 
great organization. Uh, you do not need to be a professional to use this site. Okay. And they do have under ethics and standards, they have information on the genealogical proof standard. Let me bump this up a bit for people so they can see. Uh, these are the things, reasonably exhaustive search. You could say exhausted because that's what you'll be. But what that means is you can't just take the first document you find to prove a birth date. I had nine documents from my great grandfather and one of them had an incorrect date. Okay. So Complete and accurate source citations. Do not be scared by source citations. Think of yourself as a genealogy journalist. You're just saying who, what, why, when, and where. That's it. That's all you're doing. You should be able to write a basic uh, cite source citation in less than a minute. Thorough analysis and correlation. Make sure that that document fits with all the other research you've done for that person. Resolution of conflicting evidence. This is where people go wrong. I need to know why that one record had a different date. Was it a secondary uh, information? Was it a transcription? Maybe it was a derivative and someone just made a mistake. Okay. And then you need to write a soundly written conclusion based on the strongest evidence. And it doesn't have to be a very long statement. So I could say, uh, my great-grandfather, John Ralph Austin, was born on January 31st, 1896 in Lowville, Lewis County, New York, as proven by his World War I draft card uh, written in his hand and signed on June 5th, 1916. Boom. That's it. That's almost 50 words or less. Okay? Great. But that really – it 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 really – you know, you would want a family tree with long roots that's sturdy, right? Something that's not going to topple over. And paying attention to evidence evaluation and genealogical proof standard can help bring that about. H is for handwriting. What is the best resource for deciphering handwriting or handwritten records used for genealogy research? Well, family search, wiki to the rescue again, or family search to the rescue. They have, there's an article called Handwriting Helps. Even in the days of artificial intelligence, and I've been using it to transcribe uh, transcribe records, this is still worthwhile. So it goes through. Did you know secretary hand is an old English version of handwriting? Uh, and they've got guides here. Uh, they've got an early American handwriting game. Uh, and basically it gives you examples so if you need to try and decipher something, this is a really good article. It's in my research toolbox. Here's uh, Old English Guide A to M. And this is, you know, capital A could be in all these varieties. Uh, and here's an exercise for you to try and figure it out. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's wild, right? But again, every little thing that we have helps, and it helps review clues uh, to our ancestors. I is for intellectual property. How do you determine whether a record, like a vital record, a high school yearbook, is protected by copyright and if you can still use the record for genealogy research? Okay. I will tell you there's no one copyright law. Uh, there's something called fair use and it's interpretation by court and everything. If you want to be safe, the American Library Association has a great section on copyright tools, and I use this all the time. Uh, and accept cookies. And so there, this is the one that I like the most. This is the public domain slider. When something's in public domain, that means it's free of copyright, okay? And this is the tool that I use. And look at all these little things. Well, if it's after 1928 and before, before 1978, if it was published without a copyright notice, then it's in the public domain, see? And so this is a nice little cheat sheet, okay? And uh, I, yeah, and so basically you can come down here uh, and look at all of this information. I like this a lot. Again, this is one of the things that's on my office wall uh, because I actually use it quite a bit. J is for Julian Calendar. Uh, and we. it's funny that we bring this up today is leap day february 29th that extra day that's added every four years uh so what is the julian calendar versus the gregorian calendar okay julian is also called the old calendar okay and how does it impact genealogy research well again a great article at wiki at the family search wiki basically uh the gregorian calendar was uh took account 
for uh, the Julian calendar, calendar not being accurate over many, many centuries. Okay. The biggest date, so it was in 1582 that Pope Gregory adopted it. So it's called the Gregorian. In the in the British Empire, they didn't change until 1752. So George Washington, for instance, he was born, I believe, in 1732. Uh, and so you'll see his birth date written, uh, you know, basically as uh, 1732 uh, slash 33 or something like that, uh, you know. Uh, around there, any dates between first, January 1st and uh, 25th of March, it affects that, okay? Uh, so that's what you should know. Uh, by the way, Greece, and I do a lot of Greek research since I'm Greek Orthodox, is was the last country in 1923 to actually adopt the uh, Gregorian calendar. K is for kinship and cousins. Have you ever heard of the term kith? And kin, I know it sounds like I'm saying kiss, kith. Uh, and what do they mean? And are they blood relatives to your ancestors in terms of genealogy research? I found a great article on research a com family in community context. Okay. And it goes through here in terms of what kith and kin is written by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. To me, uh, kin have been basically. Uh, it, it's been your relatives. Kith would be something like, you know, remember that aunt who really wasn't an aunt, but you all called aunt. Uh, and so that's the way it has many different interpretations. Uh, so it says make notes of pastors, godparents, witnesses. Yeah. So that's what it would be. And, you know, I was raised to call as a term of respect for older people, you know, if there were close family friends to call them aunt or uncle. So that if you ever wondered what the term is. L is for lost and found. What method did Irish immigrants to the United States use to connect with families and relatives who had arrived earlier? Now, no internet. You know, you can't post on Instagram, hey, I'm here. I just landed from, uh, from Ireland. No. There was something amazing. There, The Boston Pilot was an Irish uh, newspaper from 9, 1831 to 1920, and they would post a series of announcements saying, I'm looking for this person, or someone could say, uh, I'm going to go ahead and let, let me see if I've got my McKenzie's in here uh, and do this. And you would see this, and here's uh, a publication date of 1874, uh, and see, this is what the record looks like. And here, and that's my name, a uh, native of Dunlavin, Jamestown County, Wicklow. Uh, when last heard from, he was living in. So, and the woman, it's, this is almost like Everton's genealogical helper from way back when we used to post these queries. In a way, these are queries. Uh, Ancestry has the best collection uh, of this. Uh, it's it's also called Missing Friends. Uh, you may heard that hear that term. Magazines in New York, uh, not magazines, newspapers in New York and in Philadelphia uh, did the same thing. Bet you Irish in, uh, researchers who are new to that didn't know that. M is for mortality schedule. So what is a mortality schedule in certain U.S. census records? Well, it uh, here's an article from the Census Bureau. From 1850 to 1900, a special non-population schedule was done. And basically, it uh, and so they say 1850 to 1880, 1885. Really, I think it, it's here because 1885 is only for certain censuses for certain states. Uh, it basically recorded someone who had died in the previous year. I found this helpful in 1870. My second great grandfather, second, David O'Keefe, uh, he died on January 2nd, 1870. He fell into a tanning vat. A vat of acid at the tanning factory. And I was able to find the cause of death, the physician, because it's on this separate document and the family number ties back to the population schedule. So I always look for that information there. Great. Next one. N is for naturalization. In the U.S., what is the naturalization process and what records are useful for genealogy? What that are produced. Yeah, a lot of people go wrong when it comes to immigration to find these records. 
And the reason is that basically you had to go to a U.S. district court and it was a le it was a court legal process. OK, uh, so it's not by state necessarily for New Jersey. Those might be in U.S. District Court for New York, New York. Uh, see what I'm saying? Delaware might be in the U.S. District Court for Philadelphia, depending on the time. Uh, and so, oops, here we go. Archives, National Archives has a great information, a great in, uh, record uh, process of the information. Basically, you had to make a declaration of intent. Uh, and then you had to go through and get your citizenship. Uh, and so there are certificates. Uh, so it shows what what exists and it's all based on a federal court. OK, so it, it's it's for newcomers. It can be very newcomers to genealogy. It can be very, very difficult to understand. Always for occupation. How do you find a description for an occupation, especially one from the 18th or 19th century? Yeah. You know, do you know what a farrier is? A farrier is a blacksmith who does horseshoes. Uh, what is the other one? A cooper makes barrels, uh, a tinker uh, and all of those. So what I found here, and this is kind of arcane, it is out of the UK. So there's a little bit of a bias there, but it's an A to Z index. And I use this all the time of old, old occupations. Okay, what is a brailler? Let's see what a brailler is. A brailler made girls from elasticized material from the 1940s, you know? And so, yeah, it, it, it's amazing. Maker of cloaks or coarse garments. So whenever I encounter an occupation that I'm not familiar with, this, again, this resource is up here in my genealogy research toolbox that I have uh, on my browser. P is for plat map or plat book. Again, something that would be new and unusual for beginners. How is a plat map or a plat book use for, useful for genealogical research in the U.S.? Well, this is from Rockford Map, which is right here in Rockford, Illinois. It gives a great history of plat books. Plat books were the way that state or federal government land was parceled out and numbered. Okay. And so it talks about the public land system. You may have heard of the Homestead Act of 1862, where all the land uh, west of the Mississippi was actually given to homesteaders, 60 acres, I believe, if they could prove that they improved it. OK, but you see, you've got these plat numbers and you've got some names here uh, and it's, it's it's got all these directionals. It can be very, very difficult uh, to work with. OK, but it gives the best overview of plat books. And this is one way when you're researching land for your ancestor and you want to know how did they get it or how did the person get it before them? Where did it come from? Uh, it helps when you're doing a house history or a land history. Q is for query. What is a genealogy query? And in what form can you find a genealogy query? Well, I will tell you the history. Uh, genealogy queries used to be made in a newsletter called Everton's Genealogical Helper that was published monthly. And you would take out an ad listing your mailing address or your phone number if you were brave. And you'd say, I'm looking for this person. Can you help me? Well, then we had AOL and Bolton Boards and Prodigy Online in the 90s. I know I'm dating myself. And now, basically, Facebook is used for queries. Join a Facebook genealogy group. Also, Cindy's list has a really good list of queries and message boards. Did you know Ancestry's message boards still work? I got a response last year to a query I post in 1999, uh, and that proves why you should never change your email address. Great. R is for return. What is a marriage return? And is it the same as a marriage certificate? We have them here in Illinois, and I didn't know what they were at first. Okay, so... Basically, a marriage, there's a great article by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. A marriage record is a marriage record is a marriage record not. And this is what a marriage return. It explains what it is. After the ceremony, after the wedding, usually the minister or the priest had to fill out a form and send it back, return it to the vital records office to prove that the ceremony took face, place. It was one thing to take out a license. 
okay? But it was another thing to actually confirm that the ceremony ever took place. And so when it took place, who the witnesses were, who the officiant were, was uh, to do that. So you'll find it common in more in certain states more than others. I know Illinois has records uh, online. I believe it's actually through Family Search with returns. Uh, and so that way you can get the actual marriage date, a license date. Sometimes you had to wait three days depending on the state, or you could get right away if it was a Gretna Green. And a Gretna Green, by the way, is a location that had more liberal marriage laws. That means you would go over the border. Here in Illinois, if you went over to Lake County, Indiana, Crown Point was the town, you could actually get married, I believe, the same day, and you could get married to uh, um, uh, a man and a woman could get married where the woman was younger than what the age limits were in Illinois. Those are called Gretna Greens. Gretna Green was a town in Scotland that was known for its very liberal marriage laws. S is for Social Security Death Index, also known as SSDI. So what is this thing and how can it be accessed? And are the records reliable for use in genealogy research? Okay, Family Search has a great article uh, on this. And let me tell you, encapsulate it, what it is. The SSDI was originally created so that banks and insurance companies and other businesses could verify a social security number so that someone coming in to open a bank account using a social security number didn't use one for a dead person. We've all heard about this. Uh, that's why there's a, about a three-year hold right now on how updated the records are with SSDI because some people, uh, some bad people, have been using uh, the S social security numbers of dead people to actually file for tax returns. Uh, and so, so it was meant to combat fraud, but basically for our benefit, it will show when someone was born, when someone died, where their last social security payment was sent to uh, and other things. Uh, and so it goes through here are the contents and name social security number, the state that issued the social security card, the birth date, the death date, the last residence, and sometimes you can see a lump sum payment. Uh, and it not everyone is in the SSDI. I know my mom that died in 2015 is listed there. Uh, and that's a way of me just verifying other information. So it is very, very valuable. Uh, and so right now, Family Search, uh, here it is through 2014. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Genealogy Bank, which is a paid newspaper site, may have a more up to date one. Uh, but usually with our research, and don't forget, Social Security didn't start until 1935. So you're not going to find things before that. Great. T is for timelines and the importance of them. How can a timeline help you with your genealogy research? Well, uh, Kimberly Powell, uh, one of the best genealogists out there, if you ask me, uh, wrote for ThoughtCo. ThoughtCo is owned by the New York Times. Uh, and there's a great article. Please still be here. Thank you. And it goes through uh, how timelines can really help you. I use timelines all the time, and this is how. I want to see the gaps in my research. An example from my third great grandfather, Gustav Henneberg, came here in 1881. And I noticed, oh, I didn't look in the 1905 New York State Census. There was a New York State Census. I also saw, oh, I didn't look in the 1915 New York State Census. This is a man that lived till 1942. Uh, so it can really show you what the gaps are. Also, timelines are great when you overlay, overlay uh, national events like World War I, uh, like uh, – you know, the uh, sinking of the Titanic. It's that whole social history aspect that we want to know how our ancestors actually lived. U is for unclaimed mail notice. What? Okay. How can you use data from an unclaimed mail notice for genealogy research? Does this notice have another name? Yes. It's also known as uh, letters waiting at the post office. Genealogy Bank has a great free article. This is a situation. Think about it. Before telephones were common, and you might go and uh, stay for the summer uh, with family, okay? How would you know if you had a letter waiting? It would be sent to general delivery in your name. That was very common. 
Okay. So what happens is that uh, you would have, here's one from 1765. And you would basically find a notice in the newspaper saying that these people have 30 days to claim, you know, this mail. Uh, and so these, these were common. And let's see if we can find here. This one is 1842. Okay. And so this, and why is it beneficial for us? I can put a person at a specific date in a specific location. I can't guarantee that they ever showed up there, but they were expected there. Or at least a letter was waiting for them, and that's full of clues. I bet you didn't even know this existed. I mean, now basically, I've got I'm signed up for USPS alerts, and I get an alert every morning with my with my uh, mail scanned, uh, and you can do that. Well, they, that didn't exist, and it shows the number here. Uh, and let's see, letters list. Uh, oh, I guess there's a ladies list too. Uh, and so it was, it, it seems kind of odd right now, uh, but it's one of those things that uh, that really is helpful. I'm glad that they did it. B is for vertical files. What types of repositories hold vertical files? What information did they hold? And how did they get their name? Uh, so my heritage has an article written by Melissa Barker. Uh, basically, a vertical file is this. When you go into a library and archive, ask if they have vertical files for genealogy. It's a catch-all. It comes from the vertical filing cabinets, and it could have family folders. It could have letters, diaries. It, it's a potpourri of stuff. You never know what you're going to find, but sometimes you have to ask for them. They're not always advertised. It also just may, may mean loose pieces of paper you know something from a family reunion etc uh and so always ask uh, and it's more common than you realize and you're missing out on some really great stuff w is for worldcat as i mentioned this before worldcat is also owned by oclc and what is it and how can it be used for genealogy research so worldcat is a free uh service okay and I'm going to accept all my cookies. This They have over, I think, 2 billion records, 2 billion items. Let's say that you're looking for a specific uh, hardcover book that has to do with your family, and your local library doesn't have a copy. You can actually go in here, and I'm going to say Descendants, or I'm going to say Hugo Freer Genealogy. Hugo Freer is my ninth great grandma, great grandfather, uh, who uh, helped uh, establish New Paltz, New York, in 1675. He was uh, a Huguenot, uh, and he was uh, basically uh, thrown out of France for being Protestant. And here it is. Here's one. Let's say that I want this one. Okay, I can go and I can see the local libraries. Now, my Newbury Library. 5.2 miles from where I am, University of Chicago, Wisconsin, Allen, and this is great. Also, look, you can borrow it. So they will send a copy to your local public library. You may not be able to take it home, but you could at least use it there. So if there's something that's really rare, like this one is rare, uh, Descendants of David Hutman. He is also my ninth great-grandfather, uh, New York Dutch in Albany, 1645. And this is it. It's a very, very rare book. And uh, yeah, in Idaho Falls or Family Search Library. Yeah, I actually have one copy. There were 100 that were privately printed. But you could see, now usually you pay little or nothing to have it sent. Uh, and so I could say only public libraries, and that's not going to make it there. But use WorldCat. Don't automatically go out and buy a book all the time. X is for X marks the spot. What does it mean when there is an X in place of a signature? Okay. Well, in paleography, uh, basically it's, it's based on the Christian cross, but as a way for illiterate people who didn't know how to write and read to mark their name on legal documents. Okay. And it goes through here and it should show X's and things like that. Okay, and X or for what X marks the spot. This is and it goes through uh, here. You know their marks. So 
perfect. Let me close a few things. And we're coming down to the home stretch, people. Why is for yearbooks? Are high school or college yearbooks useful for genealogy research? Are there other types of yearbooks? Family Tree Magazine has a very, very good article. Uh, yearbooks are great for finding a woman's maiden name. Yes, I don't want to sign up now. Thank you. Uh, and so uh, yearbooks are around since the 1890s, mostly for colleges, uh, some high schools in more affluent areas. There are also other yearbooks, folks. If you had a doctor uh, that maybe belonged belong to the state medical association, they would put out a yearbook. It would have very extensive obituaries. It would say uh, who got married. Uh, and basically who clo who moved offices. It's really a great resource. One of the best places to find them is out on Google Books. Let's see if I can get here. And Google Books is a great way to find free yearbooks. Also, Ancestry has a very good collection. And we're here. Z is for zip code. I just threw this in. Uh, it was hard to find one that ended uh, something genealogy that ended it was started with z so do you know what the term zip and zip code stands for and when were they created and are, are they used in genealogy research well they're created in 1963 a year after i was born uh and basically it stands for uh I can't remember. Now I'm not going to uh, zone improvement plan. That's what it was. And you can learn how certain sections of the country were were numbered. Uh, you can learn. And there are 38,000. That's when the system uh, started. Uh, and so I thought that this would this was just something interesting. Uh, and you would know that they didn't exist pre-1963 here in the United States. OK, so thank you for being here. I'm going to ask Colin to step in and help me in a minute with some questions. Uh, don't forget to give feedback in the app. Uh, and so uh, you can do that. Uh, I don't know if this applies to me because I'm virtual, uh, but you may get a survey. You can always reach me at highdefjan at gmail.com. Uh, sometimes questions don't come to us. I'm going to hop back on the camera. Uh, so sometimes questions don't come to us right away, and I realize that. It may come later tonight, next week. You can always email me. I, and I've got two other things. Uh, one is my site, Genealogy Bargains. Uh, and does it work? Yes, it does. Uh, and so you may see things, you know, offers. And, and uh, also I've got a lot of cheat sheets and uh, listing free webinars. So take a look. I'd appreciate that. And you can also sign up for my e-news. I have an extensive mailing list and I keep people updated on the latest news in technology and genealogy, especially artificial intelligence. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. And Colin, what did you think? Well, I just loved this presentation. And I i mean, this is a handout that's rich in resources and a presentation that I'll be coming back to again. Yeah. What was the most unusual one for you? Oh, um, I loved the whole idea about the um, missing or, or waiting for the letters. Oh, yeah, I know. It's bizarre. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about that. But that's a great resource if, uh, if yeah. there's a list from a local um, post office where... Yeah. That wasn't picked up. So that yeah, was I remember when my mom, she was not a digital native. She had to learn computers and I signed her for Hotmail and she said, well, how will I know I have email? I said, mom, you have to check it every day. It's like you have to go down to the post office every day. They don't call you up and say, hey, you've got mail. Uh, so, yeah, but it is. It's really bizarre. People don't realize that that was fairly common. Yeah, this is great. Well, one other thing that um, there was a great comment here and uh User uh, Nancy said that my grandfather was born in 1908 and did not have a birth certificate. His birth was not registered until 1952, two years before he left Haiti. And so I'm in do I, I'm I'm making the uh, suspicion here that he was born in Haiti. But that's an interesting right. scenario, isn't it? It is. The other thing is most people had to get a birth certificate many times to prove work. My mom, uh, I know she, she was born in 1941, and and uh, then there was a delayed certificate I found for her, uh, and it was because she started work, you know, and this is about 1958, and uh, or to apply for Social Security or for a passport, you know, uh, and it's very common in rural areas uh, where births were at home and they just weren't registered. 
Well, I want to thank you so much. Um, I I think, again, I will remind people that not only do you have um, ways to contact you, but this fantastic resource, which goes through all of those, the entire alphabet. Um, and it'll be fun to rewatch this again. Uh, as people go through, they'll watch it and add more questions, I'm sure. But uh, we want to thank you so much for your right. presentation today. Thank you. And I appreciate your help and everyone at Family Search. You, you guys have been great. Okay. Awesome. Take care. Thank Bye, you. everyone.